Hey guys, welcome to Current Silicon Valley Church. We're honored that you'd be here with us, whether you're sitting around your dining table, you're in your living room space, or you're still in bed. We're glad that you could join us. Uh, as, many as, you, uh, as many of you know, we record elements here for our Sunday worship a few days in advance in order to give our amazing team the chance to put things together for us to worship in this way. And you also know that this was a big week in our nation with the election. We didn't actually have the election results back when we recorded this just a couple days ago. And so I wanted to say a prayer, even as I'm not in my typical space right now, uh, just to, to pray for our nation and to prepare our hearts for, for worship today. Uh, this is from 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people for kings and all in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Let's pray. Father, no matter who we voted for, uh, we, we want to pray for our nation and our nation's leaders. Father, we want to pray for President-elect Joe Biden, and for Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Lord, would you bless them and their families? We, we also want to pray for, for President Trump, that you'd bless his family. And Father, we ask that you would lead through our leaders, that you would bless them and lead through them, that we might live these quiet and peaceful lives that you, you ask us to pray for in all godliness and holiness. And most of all, what we, we, what we say here is what this text shows us, that, that you, God, are our Savior. Salvation is not in somebody who wins an election or in, or, or in government, uh, although we pray for such things. Lord, we pray for, for you, our Savior, to, to have your way in, in, in the primary way of helping people come to know you and grow in you. And so, Father, would you help us as your people be gospel lights in your community and in all our relationships, especially in these times. And we dedicate this morning to you. Lord, would this be a day that brings a lot of praise to your name. We worship you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, church. Let's think together now. And I will trust my Savior Jesus when my darkest doubts befall. Trust Him when to simply trust Him Seems the hardest thing of all And I will trust my Savior Jesus Trust Him when my strength is small For I know shield of Jesus is the safest place of all. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. Your gift is complete. 
Jesus, only Jesus, make my heart be ever yours. Jesus, only Jesus, help me trust you more and more. Jesus, only Jesus, may my heart be ever yours. May my heart be ever of our Savior. Thanks, guys. Let's pray. Father, if there's nothing else we do today, we want to say thank you and give you praise. That you would send your son, as we just sang, that death would be his portion and our portion, liberty. We just, we give you praise and say thank you. Thank you that we can gather in this way to worship you. 
Father, we also put our nation into your hands and our nation's leaders during this tumultuous time. Would you, would you lead us and would you guide us? And Father, would you give us each your spirit of peace and power as we, as we understand that salvation ultimately comes from you and you alone, from, from nowhere else. Father, would you help us be a gospel light in our community and in all our relationships? And then last but not least, Father, we, we ask for your spirit to help us understand your word that you have in front of us now. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome everybody to Current. I'm David. Today we're continuing our series, We're Still the Church, reminding ourselves of God's mission for His church. A mission that hasn't gone away just because we're in the middle of shelter in place. If anything, this mission is just as important today as ever before. And so we've been working our way through the book of Acts as it chronicles the establishment of the early church and the spreading of the gospel. Well, one of my unstated goals in the midst of this series is to, yes, hit upon some of the, the more well-known texts and passages of the book of Acts, but to also touch upon some of the lesser-known texts and draw lessons from those. So last week, we looked at one of these lesser-known texts as we saw Barnabas' incredible impact through the underestimated power of encouraging and activating others, how God through him really just brought Christianity onto the, speed, onto the scene, spreading the gospel through the church at Antioch and through ultimately the Apostle Paul because of God's work through Barnabas in these lesser known ways. Today we also come to a lesser known text as we see the place where Barnabas and Paul, after having worked together for a little while, fall into a sharp disagreement. In fact, the translation could be more literally said to have fallen in a heated disagreement. Uh, this is one of those texts that not a lot of people give a lot of thought to. I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on it. When I was doing my study this week, not a lot of commentators had a whole lot to say about it because it's not really considered all that much. But Paul later would say all scripture, all scripture is profitable. And so today I think we're going to see some, some pretty helpful and relevant lessons from a lesser known text here in Acts chapter 15. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 36 through 41. And if you don't have a Bible, that's fine. The words will be on your screen. Acts 15 verses 36 through 41. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. All right, so here's what we see. By this time in Acts, Paul and Barnabas had become close friends and, and ministry partners. They had already completed what's known as Paul's first missionary journey, heading around the upper Mediterranean uh, Sea to, to start churches. And God had really blessed their ministry together. Tons of people were putting their faith in Jesus. Churches were being established. And the gospel for the first time was really getting out of the Judean area. But what we see here in this text is that Barnabas wouldn't ultimately continue on with Paul on his secondary, second missionary journey. Uh, this would be the, the end of their ministry relationship together, so far as we can tell. What happened? Well, a sharp disagreement ended their fellowship. What over? Well, the, a man named John Mark. John Mark had accompanied them on the first missionary journey, and at one point, the problem was, Mark basically bailed on them. And we can read about this in Acts 13, which says, From Pan uh, Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. That's all we're told. Uh, we don't know much more information. Luke, the writer of Acts, doesn't give it to us. What led Mark to leave at that point? Uh, we can't know for sure. Some commentators surmise that Mark was uncomfortable with these Gentiles, these non-Jews coming to Jesus, putting their faith in Christ. And so he went back to Jerusalem to kind of, you know, rat on Paul. But that's just conjecture. Really, we don't know. 
What we do know is by the time of our text today, uh, here in Acts 15, Paul felt that he had deserted them in such a way that he didn't think it was wise to take John Mark on this next trip. Paul felt so strongly about this that he was just going to put his foot down and say, I, 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 we're not, I'm not going to go if, if he's going to go. He can't come with me. Barnabas, on the other hand, felt strongly that they should bring Mark. This might have, to have had to do with uh, Barnabas and Mark being cousins. We know that from uh, the letter to the Colossian church. It probably had something to do with Barnabas' character and what we know of his heart. Barnabas was all about activating people, encouraging people, developing them. And he, so no, undoubtedly he, was, he saw Mark as an opportunity to kind of help him redeem himself and just get back into the game. But the result here, based on Paul feeling this way about Mark and Barnabas feeling that way, was verse 39. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark, Paul took Silas. Here's the first lesson I think we can take out of this text. We see in the extreme case, sometimes it could be best for Christians to part ways. In the extreme case, which I really want to emphasize here, in the extreme case, because this is, first of all, description, right? It's not prescription. It's not saying this is, therefore, they needed to, to break company and go this different way. It's just, it's just telling us what happened. But note that Luke is not really saying somebody was right here and the other person was wrong and, and they should have gone about it this way. There's none of that kind of language. It's all just kind of left neutral. It's an extreme case that this had to happen. How do I know it's an extreme case? Because so much of the New Testament scriptures are saying things like, "For you know, bear with one another, be patient with one another, love others and look to the needs of others first. It's, it's using language like you, we need to go the extra mile to try to work things out. I mean, you know, the New Testament talks a lot about how the, the, the church are, are members of a body. You know, some's a hand and arm and leg. It's, it's, not, it's not like we could say, well, you know what, I just want to go ahead and amputate. And then other parts describe the relationships of, of Christians, you know, as, as a family. It's not like we just can say, hey, you know, I no longer like you as a brother, so, you know, bye, or I'm out of here. No, we're called to really work at it, to bear with one another. This is an absolute extreme case. And even Luke, in the way that he's writing Acts here, this account, seems to suggest that this was a sad scenario, that this was not the ideal. And we need to understand from this text that Paul and Barnabas, for their part, were really trying to make it work. Again, some of this doesn't really come through in our English translation, but in the Greek, he's often using the imperfect tense here, which is just to say it was an ongoing discussion that Barnabas and Paul had. When it says in verse 37 that Barnabas wanted John Mark to come, that means he was at it persistently, trying to make his case, uh, really, really trying to work it through with Paul. And his and Paul's parting wasn't, this is to say his and Paul's parting wasn't just done at the snap of fingers. That they just figured, you know what, forget you, man. I'm out of here. No, they, they tried really, really hard. They, they didn't separate lightly. This was an extreme case. And again, remember, Luke here in no way conveys right and wrong. We're not told, and Paul was being in the right, left with Silas. Or, that, or, or Barnabas being in the right, seeing things clearly, uh, went ahead and took Mark. It feels like Luke is actually bending over backwards to not comment on who is right and wrong. Which leads to suggest that here in the extreme case, not ideal and, and very sadly, sometimes it might make sense for Christians to part ways, at least for a time. Now, as we think about this practically, uh, none of this applies to you here at, at Current, uh, wink, wink, right? This is, this is for future ministries if the Lord leads you to other places. Uh, but what do we see here? Okay, this is not something to jump to. We are supposed to work out as best we can with others, forbearing, being patient. But sometimes if there's still no alignment there's grace and freedom to try to work things out in a different way. And I really think that's the key here. What we see here is that at the end of the day, Paul and Barnabas' disagreement was an alignment issue or issue of methodology. What we're not seeing here is that one was right and one was wrong. One was sinful and the other one was just, you know, to be condemned. It doesn't say any of that. One was above board, one was just, just out of place. No, no. 
I think what we see here is they just had a misalignment. They couldn't get things resolved on the methodology of their mission, which really leads us to what I think is the main point here in this text, the next two thoughts. First, we see the early church fought for mission. Something that was not up for grabs, even in the midst of a heated disagreement, was the mission. At the end of the day, what was really driving Paul and Barnabas here? Not winning an argument. It was not trying to be right and prove the other wrong. It was not just getting fed up with the other person and moving on. No, what really drove Paul and Barnabas both, just in different ways, was the mission of Christ. Where do we see that? Look again at verse 36. This whole thing starts, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. What's that saying? That's saying Paul and Barnabas were both driven by the Great Commission, Jesus' mission to the church, to help people into the faith, that's the first half of the Great Commission, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, going and help people coming to know Jesus. And then the second half of the Great Commission is, as Jesus put it, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded, helping people grow into the likeness of Jesus. That's what drove these guys, the Great Commission, going out and starting churches to this effect. And so it's important to understand that that's what was driving them here. Not to be right, not, not to prove the other wrong, not just because they had a little tiff and just couldn't stand the other person. No, they just had a difference of methodology. It was a, a, an alignment issue. To Paul, Mark was a liability to this mission. He had bailed on them before. He had deserted them. And he just was at the place where he couldn't trust that Mark would be there for them this next trip where they were just making the mission of Christ, helping people come to know Jesus, just absolutely central. He didn't feel at his core that he could trust Mark on that journey. But to Barnabas, Mark was probably part of the mission, right? As they're going around, strengthening churches, helping people who know Jesus become more like Christ, Mark was one of those types of people. Probably Barnabas was thinking, hey, how can I, through this ministry, help Mark also become more like Jesus himself? Which is a big part of ministry here at Current, by the way. Whenever we do ministry, all right, projects or service or outreaches, we don't just want to do the event. We want to help people develop as we do the event, all ourselves included, becoming more like Jesus even as we serve. But who was right? Paul, Barnabas, again, we don't know, we're not told. And you know, who's to say they weren't both right? Because they're both trying their best with what was before them, faithfully to serve and follow the Lord, pushing his gospel forward. Think of it this way. What they were not doing was going to give up the centrality of the mission. They weren't even gonna let a disagreement, as much as they loved and cared for the other, stand in the way, distract them from helping people come to know Jesus and grow in him. The early church fought for the mission. The second thing we also see them fight for was unity. The early church fought for unity, to preserve unity, which is kind of funny uh, on the surface because you might be thinking, unity. David, how do we see them here fighting for unity? I mean, isn't a sharp disagreement you know, evidence of, of disunity? But check out how this plays out. We're not told here, it's not even implied that Paul and Barnabas in this disagreement mistreated one another or slandered the other. Quite to the contrary, we see that when they parted ways, that the church, verse 40, commended them to the grace of the Lord. There's so much packed into this, this verse right here. Because it seems to suggest that the church was giving their blessing to both parties. And think about it. You didn't, you didn't have to grow up in the church uh, to understand the dynamics that probably were happening. I mean, you could just experience this in any organization. If two high caliber leaders start to have a disagreement in a community, uh, what's going to happen? People are going to start to draw sides. You know, some people undoubtedly started to say, hey, I see it. I see it the way Paul sees it. I think Mark shouldn't go on that trip. And others saw it, probably sided with Barnabas, thought, hey, you know what? I think Barnabas, Mark should be given a second chance. You should let him go. It could have had any, any chance for seeds of disunity to kind of take root and grow, or, or to use another analogy, for yeast to kind of spread through the, through the, the dough. But the result was 
Both parties were commended by the believers, by the church. The early church fought for unity. Unity was not up for grabs, even in the midst of a sharp or heated disagreement. It's really hard, but it's something that we as a church have to fight for. I mean, the New Testament is filled with so much to say about unity, how fragile it can be, how the church needs to preserve it, how we need to have one voice, one thought, one heart, one mind. Unity is something that we have to fight for. And it is something when disagreements happen, that it can easily come into question. It can easily be attacked, but the church needs to prioritize unity. Sadly, I've seen people part ways, and often when they've parted ways, it's been at the neglect of unity, and it's been at the neglect of God's mission. But the scriptures in no way commend that. So here's a summary of thoughts. that The mission and unity weren't up for grabs in the early church that fellow believers ought to do their best, our best, with the sincerest of humility, to follow God as best we can. And in the extreme case, when it's just not working, when we've tried to work it out, tried to make it work, it, it's deeply sad, it's not the ideal, but sometimes the text shows in the extreme case that it is. it might be okay for, for parting of ways. Cindy and I, I've had a chance to listen to a very wise pastor a few times at conferences, a pastor down in the Southern California area, a guy named Larry Osborne. And he has a really insightful way of thinking about it. He, he, he talks about how uh, the, the local churches in a given region is like one giant Sunday school class, or excuse me, it's one church filled with many uh, Sunday school classes. You know, it's like every, it, it, they, all the churches in an area comprise one church, but each represent a different flavor of how the mission, God's mission in the church, capital C church, is being played out. And we just need to find a good fit and alignment on the on mission and unity, preferably really early on. And once, once we find a good place to, to put down roots and, and become family and, and roll up our sleeves together for the sake of the mission that God calls us to. Something kind of funny uh, here is that I, I actually find this text really refreshing. I don't find their disagreement here refreshing. I mean, goodness, disagreements are not fun. I don't find that refreshing. But I find it refreshing that this is in the scriptures. Why? Because first of all, it's really authenticating. I mean, Luke, the writer of, of Acts here, only had a limited amount of space to talk about the establishment of the church and how the gospel got out and, and following Paul and following Barnabas. And here he includes a sharp disagreement. That's kind of embarrassing on a level. Why would you include that unless it, it truly happened? But the other reason why I find this really refreshing is that this is life. Life is messy. And even the strongest leaders like a Paul and Barnabas weren't always ever perfectly aligned. And I think that really comes to our main point here. The, the fact that none of us are perfect. All of us are deeply flawed and that will come out in relationships. And if it hasn't already, just give it some time, it will. And even when we're trying our absolute best to follow God and to seek what he is doing, we're still not gonna always get it right. But God is always working out his plan in the short term and in the long term. And if Paul and Barnabas could fall into sharp disagreement, I think the point is any of us could. Paul went on with Silas to plant churches around the upper regions of the Mediterranean. And the result was nothing less than Christianity ultimately becoming what it is today, rippling out to what it is today. God, through Paul, just brought the gospel to the Gentiles, all non-Jews, which means if you're logged on today and you are or you know someone who is a Christian of non-Jewish descent, it was from God working through Paul. I mean, he just went on to have an incredible impact, God, through him. And Barnabas went on to do some really amazing things, including activating John Mark. John Mark is actually the same Mark of the gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That's the same Mark. Mark would go on to write the gospel account of Jesus. Undoubtedly, Barnabas had a big 
hand involved in that. And you know what's really interesting to consider? I hadn't thought about it until this week. Mark is known in his gospel account of Jesus to really focus in on the servanthood of Christ. Uh, very famously, Jesus said in, in his account, uh, for I did not come to be served, but to serve and offer my life as a ransom. That's profound to consider in the context of Mark's life because Mark and his servant ministry failed, bailed on, on Paul and Barnabas when they really needed him. And I can't help but think and see a beauty there of God redeeming in Mark's life, even to the point that he could see more, more clearly that servanthood, the wonderful, perfect servanthood in Christ as he tell, told his gospel account of Jesus. And then John Mark, as well as Barnabas, would ultimately be reconciled with Paul. Uh, we know in, in 2 Timothy uh, 4 that Paul, right before he was killed, while he was shackled in a, in a dank cellar, probably days, if, if top, at weeks tops from being executed, he wrote a letter to another ministry associate say, asking for, for Mark to be sent to him because, quote, Mark is useful to me in my ministry which is really incredible. Paul is literally you know, facing execution, probably within days of dying. And of all the things that he requests, of the few that he states, he says, and, and bring Mark because he's useful to me in my ministry. Those years later and showing evidence that they had been reconciled. And Paul would later write about Barnabas in his letters talking about how things were all good at that point. Guys, this is the power of God. God is in the, the business of redeeming all things, even the messiness of life, hard things in relationships that have happened in the past. What he calls us into for our part is to seek his kingdom first, and he'll work out all the other factors. Or as Paul would later write to the Roman church in Romans 12, 18, he says, so far as it depends on you, live at peace with one another. We're called to do our best with what we can control to live at peace with others, to offer love and, and reconciliation. And the point is, as followers of his, we need to put mission and unity first. And you know, even if we're doing a pretty good job of that, things are gonna happen sometimes. We're sinful people, we're broken people. We're gonna fall into disagreement. We're gonna fall into the messiness of life. But God is exceedingly gracious and he's working out his plans, including in relational mess. Because after all, this is the gospel. This is what Jesus came into the world to do. This was his mission, to die for us and, and rise again to life that we might be unified with him and each other. That was his mission to bring us into unity. And you know what? Jesus understood what it meant to have people bail on him, to have people desert him, because he didn't have just one person desert him. In his hour of need, everybody deserted him. And yet Jesus' mission was to go and bring us into unity with himself and with one another. And so the point here today is we can offer that same love to each other with his help. I want to start by saying, though, if you're here today logged on and you've never received Jesus, the gospel or good news of Christ is that he died on the cross to offer you forgiveness of sins. And God the Father raised him again to life to offer you life forever with him because of what he has done. Through nothing you can do but receive him by faith alone. And you can receive that even now by saying, Lord, I just want to receive you. I believe in my heart what you have done for me on the cross I want to follow you from this day forward. And if that's you, let us know. We'd love to come alongside you, resource you. But if you have made that decision, if you are a follower of Jesus, I think there are a few possible takeaways for us as we wrap things up here. Now, the first thought here is your past mistakes don't have to define your future. Your past mistakes don't have to define your future. I mean, think about Mark's place and how he messed up in the past, but how God redeemed that. Think about Paul and Barnabas' disagreement and how that could have just gone away of just, just real pain and, and never being reconciled. God is in the business of reconciling, starting with our past, which is going to be broken because we're sinful people in desperate need of God's love. But God offers his love so freely, through, freely to us 
through Christ with forgiveness and reconciliation. He wants to do a redemptive work in you. So if you have a, a burden that you're carrying from a past relationship, you don't have to carry it. You can offer that to the Lord. Uh, he will help you redeem that. Which leads us to the second possible takeaway, and that is it's never too late to reconnect with someone who has let you down. If the gospel is we all let Christ down, we all let God down, and yet he came into this world to die for us, to bring us back into relationship, it's to the degree that we start to let that sink into our hearts that we can begin to offer that to others freely, graciously. Because when we start to calculate, does that person deserve my forgiveness? we can remember that in even greater ways, we don't deserve the forgiveness of Christ and we can begin to offer that to others. And then the last thought here is related to the last. It's never too late to reconnect with someone whom you've let down. Same thought here, but if Christ died for you, it can give you and me the humility and confidence to go to the other whom we have let down to ask for forgiveness. And if they don't offer it, we just try the best that we can to offer to live at peace with one another, to extend the love that we can within our control. So there it is, a lesser known text here in the book of Acts that addresses situations that happen in the church. Uh, this is a very embarrassing situation in the early church, but it's a very real situation. It's a very messy situation, which is life. And this is where God meets us, in the messiness of life and in the messiness of relationship. It shows that he can and will accomplish a great work in us if we'll let him. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for this very real text. It's, it's messy and yet it's, it's, it's beautiful. Thank you for your beautiful and redemptive work in the mess of our lives. First and foremost, for, for sending your son to die for us to offer forgiveness and to make us clean. We just don't deserve it. And Father, from this great love that you first extended to us, would you help us offer that same love to those around us, forgiving and receiving forgiveness. And Father, would you please help us really fight for to preserve the gospel mission that you've entrusted to us as a church, to reach those far from you, to build up those who call upon you. And would you please protect and preserve unity. For without your help in any of these things, we cannot do it. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's continue this time of worship now through song. Make us one. Make us one. By the power of your Spirit, make us one. So your kingdom, Lord, your kingdom will come. Make us one, Lord, make us one. Try that again. Make us one. Make us one. Make us one. By the power of your spirit. Oh, 
Lord, we pray that you would make us one. Would you help us work through our differing methodologies when they do arise to help us to be united uh, in seeking the renewal, the kind of renewal that only your hope can provide on earth as it is in heaven. We continue to pray for our divided country, uh, crisis after crisis this year. Help us to recognize that we're poor and needy, that we need you, and would you bring peace and healing to our land. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our worship with the offering now. This is a time when uh, we bring to God resources that he's given us to steward in worship, uh, desiring to join him in the work of renewal through the local church. You can give online at currentsv.church give or by texting a dollar amount to 84321. It was really encouraging to hear some of the takeaways coming out of uh, last week's message on uh, encouragement and activating uh, one another toward eternal life-changing work. Sounds like there were some really good conversations happening in current groups during the week as well. If you're not yet connected to a group, um, it is never too late. You can see which groups are open over at currentsv.church slash groups or just let us know that you'd like to get involved. Um, we also want to offer you another tool uh, for encouraging those you may not have seen in the last eight months or maybe you don't have contact info for maybe you're just not as in touch with and um, there might be somebody that you used to uh, connect with over phil's coffee and donuts uh, every week or someone you would run into while dropping off or picking up your kids in the kids hall maybe you're new to current and uh, there's someone that you've run into uh, that you'd love to get to know or uh, there's a teacher in your kids classroom that you'd love to thank um, ops team maybe there's someone you used to put up pipe and drape with uh, on sundays so that you'd love to give an elbow bump or a fist bump to let us help you let us send a hello or a note of encouragement uh, you can send a meaningful or a funny note, short or long, uh, to someone at Current via the form at currentsv.church slash encouragements, and our staff team will make sure it gets to them. If you give us the okay to release your contact information, we can include that um, when we send it along as well. It's like, you know, the old school Valentines that, you know, we used to send uh, in high school and middle school. Uh, consider us your vehicle to send a note of encouragement or a funny joke or a thank you uh, to somebody at Current that you appreciate. 
As mentioned last week, we are starting to make plans towards some in-person engagement in the new year. This is challenging as we don't have our own facility and there is an extra layer of complexity due to COVID, but we have seen God open hearts, open doors uh, all through our journey as uh, a church startup here in the Silicon Valley and we'll continue to trust him to do so. We do ask that you pray with us for God to go before us, for him to open the right doors and block the ones that he doesn't want us to take and just guide our steps uh, together as we follow him together. We love you current family. Go forth and encourage. Uh, have a wonderful week. Yes, it is.